This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Thank God. Well, if you'll open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, he's a medical doctor, physician, and so th this is not just for religious fanatics, this is for people from all walks of life. When you have the, the real and the authentic, it is never afraid of examination. So God is, is not a, a, afraid to do miracles in the presence of a medical doctor. Dr. Luke saw things, he saw miracles. And here he records an instance of where Jesus is talking with a religious man. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37, notice reading from the English Standard Version of Scripture. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And today I'm talking from the subject, the likewise challenge. The likewise challenge. Go and do likewise. This is the likewise challenge. Let me just go back to this, this passage again. Here Jesus meets a man and he's questioning him. This is a, a man who's well schooled in the Jewish law. He understands the law. But you know, you can understand the law and not understand the spirit of the law. When all that you are concerned about is law in order, you can miss the spirit of the law. Don't ever just get the law without understanding the spirit. Because that will put you into a rigid kind of a legalism that will make you cold and it will be devoid of the love of God. So God wants us to be an expression of his love. His banner over us is love. And we have a responsibility to do what Jesus did. He's teaching this man and he's saying, you know, he asked him, you know, what, what does the Bible say? And, you know, he had just had a conversation with this man, and it, it was basically, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And, and then he asked the question, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? And so now Jesus now shares this parable of the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, to explain and make plain here who the neighbor is. And let me just tell you in essence that your neighbor is anybody in need. It's not the person who lives next door to you. It's not the person that lives down the hall from you. It's not the person that lives across the street from you. Your neighbor is anybody who's in need. Bottom line definition. Your neighbor is anybody who's in need. It, it, it may be a financial need, it may be a spiritual need, it may be a moral need, it may be an encouragement need. It's, it's just anybody who is in need. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus describes this story here. He's telling him back in, in verse 30 that a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then he fell among thieves. Jerusalem is a place of, the, it was the spiritual capital. Jericho was a place of prosperity. 
And this begins to tell us that whenever you leave the spiritual to tr go chasing after money, your life will go down. And so he went down from Jerusalem. When you leave the place of spiritual enlightenment and power, your life cannot help but to go down. It's the moment that he left his Jerusalem, he began to go down and then he fell. You go down and you fall. He fell among thieves. And notice this, they couldn't touch him because when you're a righteous person, you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So they couldn't touch him until they first stripped him. Notice that. They stripped him, stripped him, and then they beat him. The devil can't even beat you until he strips you. That's why you got to make sure, devil, you're not going to have my praise. You put on the garment of praise. If, if he can get your garment, he can beat you. Uh, don't, don't ever let him strip you because if he strips you of your praise, if he strips you of your encouragement, if he strips you of your worship, you're naked now. You're vulnerable. But see, we are clothed. We are hid with God in Christ. But if they ever strip you of your covering, now you're in a position where you can be beaten. So they couldn't touch him until they first stripped him. They, they took his clothes and then they beat him. He's always after your praise. And that's why he'll show you negative stuff in your life. Give you, show you something that you could complain about and have you complaining instead of counting your blessings. Yeah, it happened. Yeah, it could have been bad. I mean, it, it, you know, it could have been better, but it also could have been worse. He wants you in every situation. And this is why the Bible teaches in everything, give thanks. Not for everything, in everything, give thanks. In everything, in sickness, give thanks. If you have a car accident, give thanks. If you have financial ruin, give thanks. Give thanks in it, in it, in it, that it wasn't worse than what it was. That God let you live through it and let you help somebody else so that what happened to you, maybe you can help somebody else. You can't stop what happens to you, but you can always help how you respond to that thing. And this is what he's saying. I want you to be able to be a blessing to somebody else. And so this man, he, he left his Jerusalem, his place of spiritual empowerment. And sometimes the devil doesn't start messing with you until you leave the church, until you leave your prayer room, until you leave the place of worship, of empowerment, of praise. You just come out of praise and look like here, here the devil is, is, is cutting the fool now. As soon as Moses received the Ten Commandments up on the mountain and he comes down, the people were, had made a golden calf and, and they were celebrating. There was revelry and party and going. As soon as he came out of the presence, there was a devil trying to strip him because he's trying to shift their focus, trying to shift their focus, trying to shift their perspective. And God was saying, I want to bring you to a place to where your focus will be on me no matter what's going on around no matter what's going on around, focus on me. He's saying, look, look on me. No matter what's happening, look on me. If you're ever on the sea, and if you've got motion sickness, seasickness, one of the natural remedies to be able to cure seasickness, if you're ever on the sea, fix your eyes on the horizon. The horizon doesn't move. Fix your eyes on the horizon, and it'll stabilize something in your brain and say, settle down. You got to put your eyes on that that does not move, that does not, that's, that does not shift, that, that is not going up and down. You can't keep your eyes on the stock market and live by the ups and downs of the stock market and the ups and downs of your partner's personality and their attitude and see how they feel that day. You can't deal with all of these ups and downs because when you walk into some people today, you, you, you have to say good morning gingerly just to sort of prod them to see what kind of mood are they in. Uh, are they okay with me today? Are they crazy today? You're just trying to feel it out. You know, what, what kind of demons that I'm dealing with today? I got to see what I'm dealing with. Fix your eyes on the horizon. And that's why you have to start that day. You have to gird yourself uh, by putting on the whole armor of God. You, you got to be clothed because the devil cannot touch you while you've got your armament on, while you've got your, 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 your clothing on. So they stripped him and then they beat him and then... Uh, they departed, leaving him half dead. Isn't that amazing that the devil has taken everything he's got, then he leaves you? Wouldn't it be a blessing that people could come to God while they still have something? Most people that come to God, uh, when, they, when they've got, had uh, you know, great wealth or influence and, and all of that, they, they come to him after they've lost it. Wouldn't it be something if you came while you had it? And say, Lord, I, I bring all that I am and all that I have and I, I present it to you. I make it available to you. God, use me. 
in whichever way that you so see fit. But he came and stripped him, then beat him, and then departed it, leaving him half dead. But that's where the devil messed up. Because whenever you're half dead, you're also half alive. And that's all you need. If you can come out of something with one leg and one arm, if you can come out of it, that's what's, what's a half a determination to say, God, things have not worked out exactly the way that I thought that this was going to be, but Lord Jesus, I'm still coming out. He, he messed up when he didn't kill me while he had a chance. Maybe he just couldn't kill you while he had a chance because God wasn't finished with you yet. And I'm glad that somehow God allows the wounding that happens to us on our journey. He doesn't allow it to destroy us. He allows it to develop us and to give us a testimony to be able to tell. Can you imagine that man testifying about his whole experience? Can you imagine if you, because you went and did likewise, became the hero in somebody else's testimony? Can you imagine that? To be placed in somebody's testimony to say, I was down and out and God sent a woman my way. God sent a man my way. I was down, broke, busted, and disgusted, and God had somebody to text me right at the time that I was entertaining suicidal thoughts. Can you imagine if you put yourself into the script of somebody's testimony because you accepted the likewise challenge, because you answered a call? This man, when you help people, it'll always cost you something. Please understand that. Whenever you help people, it will always cost you something. You see, remember, you notice here that the, the, the priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And then the Levite, when he saw him, pass by on the other side. Both of them said, you know what, I don't want to deal with this. But the Samaritan, the Bible says as he journeyed, in verse 33, the Samaritan, as he journeyed. See, it said that the, the priest came by chance and the Levite came by chance, but the Samaritan didn't go by chance. He came by journey. He was on his journey. God planted this wounded man on his journey. You don't have to go out of your way to help somebody. God will plant the people that you're supposed to help on your journey. They'll be on your journey. You'll bump into them. You'll nearly trip over them. You'll stumble across them. They'll be on your journey. You never have to get off your course. What's for you, God plants it on your journey, on your journey. And notice the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. He came to where the man was, and he saw him, and he had compassion. He had compassion. Compassion is not an emotion. Compassion is an intestinal will to act in mercy towards someone else. Compassion always manifests itself in action. Whenever Jesus was moved with compassion, he healed them. Compassion is not an emotion. Compassion is a compelling thing that drives a person to an act of mercy. Compassion always leads you to do something. You don't need people's sympathy. You need compassion. Because compassion, out of that compassion, they help you. Out of their compassion, they bind up your wounds. Out of their compassion, they, they, they lend you money. Out of their compassion, mercy. See, that's, that, that moves you into something totally new. The Samaritan noticed as he journeyed, when he came to him, he bound up the man's wounds. You have to be careful about people that God sends to bind up your wounds because sometimes God will send somebody into your life to bind up your wounds. And, and here's the thing about it. You, you meet somebody out in the public. I mean, you know, you, you don't have a tourniquet. And so the only way to bind up a wound is to apply pressure to it. You're already hurt. Can you imagine you're already hurt and you're trying to stop a person from bleeding out? And you see, people want to be helped in a way that's comfortable. You can't always help people in a way that's comfortable. You have to help people in a way that sometimes it feels like it's making it worse. 
And so you have to put pressure on it, not to hurt them, but to cause this thing to, to start, the blood to start coagulating so they don't bleed out. He bound up the man's wound. And you have to come under pressure. Some of you don't understand why you're dealing with so much pressure. Maybe God is trying to keep you from bleeding out. And so he does that to bind up your wounds. He does it to bind up the wound. And he's, he's taking him through a whole exercise of something that cost this man something to be able to serve somebody. And then, you know, he left him at the end and, and he left him two denarii. A denarius is a day's wage for a common laborer. So let's say if you made $500 a week, he left two days wage. So the man left $200 and said, and, and whatever he, it, it costs beyond this, I'll pay it when I come back. It cost him something. Yes, it costs you something to help people. Maybe that's why the priest and the Levi went by on the other side. Because they're like, you know what, I can't afford this today. Not today. Not today. Because whenever you get involved with hurting people, it costs you something to help hurting people. And Jesus gave all of these, the priest the Levite, and now the Samaritan that had compassion and was moved to bind up the man's wound, poured in oil and wine, put him on his own donkey. He changed places with him, changed places with him, took him to the inn, put up money because it'll cost you something. And Jesus said, now, which one of these was a neighbor to the man, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? And remember now, the Samaritans are the despised cousins of the Jews. The Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. And God will sometimes send people that don't even look like you, that you don't even care for, to come into your situation and help you. But I want you to understand this about the story of the Good Samaritan. This is not just an example of, of compassionate spirituality. This is a critique against religious passivity. It is a critique against religious passivity because both the priest and the Levite pass by on the other side not wanting to get involved because it's messy and it costs you something. But I want to caution you here, don't miss the moment. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment because it might be hidden in something that looks messy and costly, but don't miss your moment. I want you to understand when you've got the ability to be able to do something and God has placed it on your journey, I want you to notice what he says in James chapter 4 and verse 17. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. You notice that? It is sin. It is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And that's why, you know, when, when God asked Cain uh, about his brother, and uh, he, he said, something about, I don't know. He said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer is an emphatic yes. Absolutely, you're your brother's keeper. You're your sister's keeper. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. Whether or not you want to acknowledge it. We are our brother's keeper. And if there are hurt people, if there are wounded people that are on our journey, on our journey, we have a responsibility to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. The good Samaritans of the world should always reflect godly character and not religiosity. We have to respond according to who we are and not how the world treats us. We have to respond according to who we are. Don't let the bad in others change the good in you. Don't let the bad in others change the good in you. Don't let the bad in others change the good in you because sometimes you can become corrupt. And become sinister by the bad that's in other people. Don't let who they are change who you are. And I want you to realize this. We're not only supposed to do good works ourselves and serve others. We're also supposed to inspire other people to do good works also. That's why Jesus gave a likewise challenge. He said, you see what this man did? Go and do likewise. Go and find somebody who's wounded, who's hurt, that's on your path, on your path. You don't have to go out looking for them. Uh, they'll be on your path. They'll, they'll blow your phone up. They'll bump into you in the grocery store. Uh, that You'll see them at a, at, at a function. 
you'll see them. They'll be on your path somehow. Notice what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 24 says. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. The King James Version says, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. It's actually the confession of our hope because hope is the goal setter for faith. So it says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. He can be trusted. Amid uncertain times, God can be trusted to keep his promise. And then notice what he says in verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Don't just do it yourself. Stimulate someone else. Have you ever noticed how if you ever contribute to somebody on a, a GoFundMe account, it'll tell them if you want to further help, post this on your social media to maybe get somebody else involved in helping as well. Provoke somebody else to do it. Don't do it to be seen, but use your good works to then provoke somebody else to say, tag you it. I mean, it, it, I love what, what, you know, what my dad used to call friendly rivalry. He would create friendly rivalry among our own salespeople. He's like, you're not going to, I mean, a lady would stand up and give this astronomical goal. And then he would look at a man and say, you're not going to let this little woman outdo you, are you? And he would create people who were on the same team. He would create friendly rivalry. Friendly rivalry, friendly rivalry. So he says, think of ways to be able to motivate other people. Don't try to do it all yourself. Think of ways to motivate other people to get involved, to do good works and to serve other people too. See, that's all that Hebrews 10, 24 is saying. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Think of ways to motivate others. That's why Jesus told the story. And then he says, you see what the good Samaritan did? He says, go and do likewise. You go and imitate it. You go. He's like saying, now top that. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. He, he showed somebody that was compassionate, who did good works, who helped someone else. And now he says, top that. Go do likewise. Go find somebody that's hurting and top that. But the priest nor the Levite wanted to get involved. And it's so easy to turn your head. You know, when people, if when you drive up off of an exit and somebody is standing there with a sign and a cup. It's, it's so easy to put on horse blinders. You know, like we can't even see them. You know, it's like you just be looking. Every, it's, just, it's, it's, it's so easy to do that. I love something that Chris Brady said. He says the biggest lies in the world are those that people tell themselves when they are misbehaving. Isn't that something when you're not doing what you need to do and then you be lying just to rationalize your own craziness? Isn't that something? The biggest lies in the world are those that people tell themselves when they are misbehaving. And listen, if you don't seize the moment to make a difference in the life of another person, I want, to, I want you to rest assured of this. God will raise up somebody else. If you won't help, God will raise up somebody else to help. Now, I'm just telling you this. Whatever is a God-inspired idea, God-inspired ideas do not die. They only pop in somebody else's head. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that if God gives you a vision or dream, an idea to do something, and you sit on it, you will watch somebody else put that idea into manifestation. And then you'll sit back there and say, you know what, the Lord had shown me that he had he gave me the same thing. I can tell you it was in a dream. I, I know he woke me back. It was the last October. <laughs> and you sat on it. And God will, he, that, that idea will not die because you sit. He'll pop it in somebody else's spirit. Good ideas, God ideas don't die. He just pops it into the head of somebody else that will obey. God is just looking. He's just looking to say, is there anybody? Whom will I send and who will go for us? He's looking for a willing soul. So, you know, if, if you if you are a, a Levite, a priest, and trying to walk by on the other side and say, Lord, you know what? I don't want to get involved in this. God says, okay. You don't want to get involved, priest? You don't want to get involved, Levite? I'll find somebody that doesn't look like you. Somebody that you don't even like. And I'll use the least. I'll use somebody that doesn't have the degree. 
I'll use somebody who didn't come from a pristine background. Somebody whose uh, record was not sterling. I will go and I'll use somebody that you don't think should be used. But I'll find somebody. And that's why I said, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment. Look at what happened with Esther in, in chapter 4 and verse 14. I love this because here's the wise, her wise relative, Mordecai, talking to this beauty queen. He's talking to Queen Esther. He says, listen, honey, if you keep quiet at, this, at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. And who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. He's reminding her, sweetheart, you don't have to do this. But if you don't do it, God will raise up deliverance from another place. And I'm telling you, if you don't answer the call, God will raise it up from somebody else. So trust me, he's not going to wait around all day for you to make up your mind. When you're trying to walk on the other side of things and saying, Lord, you know, that's messy and I don't have time for this and I don't want to get involved in that. God says, okay, if you don't want to do it, I'll, I'll raise it up from somebody else and I'll give somebody else that blessing. I'll give somebody else a testimony. I'll use them for my glory. I'll use them for my glory. So he says, don't miss your moment. Don't miss your moment because if you renege on it, if you walk by on the other side, God is saying that I will bring deliverance from another source. I'll bring it from somebody else. Don't miss the moment. Don't think that you're so special to God that he can't use anybody else to get the idea through. Because God says, if you sit on it too long, I will move somebody else. And you will watch them build what I gave you the idea to build. You'll watch somebody else take the blueprints of what I laid out in your life. A song that I gave them. A strategy that I gave. And you'll watch somebody else manifest the same thing. Because we sit on it. He says, I'll bring it and it'll rise up from another place. So... Don't miss your moment because you never know who the Lord will put in your path for you to help. Opportunities are all around. And I'm just telling you that if church people will not work for justice and mercy, God will find the people who will. They may be Samaritans. And I, and I want to caution you about this as well. Don't get so consumed by all of the insanity that's going on in our world that you overlook hurting people right in front of you. Because oftentimes the wounded in our world are not people that have been attacked by villains, but they are people who have simply been beat down by stress and pain and fear and too much responsibility and disappointment and lack and failure. And they've just been beat down by one blow after another blow after another blow and they are hurting people that have just been beat up not by a person but they've been beat up by life and all that they're looking for they're looking for somebody to be green pastures for them just a person a place where they can lay down and rest and feed and be rebuilt just a place they're looking for that place to be rest and to, to, to rest and and just be encouraged. For somebody to just stroke their hair to say, baby, it's gonna be all right. You're gonna make it through this. They're just they just need a place to rest. Will you be the green pasture for hurting people? They just need a place to turn in because life can become overwhelming. You can have so much to do and so many people pulling from you from so many different angles and, and, and spouse needs this and children need that and, 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 and the, the, the business needs this and, and neighbors need that and other relatives are pulling on you for this and civic leaders are pulling on you for that and it's, it's just one thing after another and sometimes you're just looking for somebody to be green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He's Leads me in green pasture so he can feed me. And maybe, maybe your greatest call at some times is just to be green pastures for someone. Just a resting place where they can have their equilibrium recalibrated. They just need a resting place. Sometimes that's all that he's asking is just for you to be a resting place for people. Sometimes that resting place is just about helping a person gather their perspective. 
because they can be so overwhelmed and they're overthinking and now they're stressed out and it looks like the end of the world and they just need somebody to give them perspective. I never will forget the lady came to me some years ago and she was so stressed out about all that was going on in her world and she didn't know which way to to even turn, she was so many things. It's like my children here, myself on my job, I'm a single mom. And there were so many. She had a myriad of things that were going on. And it was too much. It was overwhelming to me. It was exhausting for me to listen to. I had to come home and take a nap after I left from her. And it, it, was, it was exhausting. But I shifted her perspective. And I just reminded her about the awesome God of this entire universe, who created it, and how small everything is in it. Because she was making a mountain out of a molehill, but there were so many molehills that it was, it was confusing to her and overwhelming. She'd made mountains out of it. And I said to her, do you understand how big God is? Do you understand that if you come to the earth, this earth is spinning revolving once every 24 hours at an incredible speed of thousand miles an hour. Do you know right now you may feel stable and it is a miracle of God that we are turning at a rate right now of a thousand miles per hour every single day just rotating a thousand miles an hour a thousand one thousand miles an hour but not only are we rotating a thousand miles an hour, I said to this woman, do you realize that we are also moving around the sun, making a full orbit, rotating once every 24 hours and moving? Now, do you know the distance that we move revolving around the sun every year, every 365 days? We move at a speed of 66,627 miles per hour. So not only are we spinning, rotating at a speed of 1,000 miles an hour, we're also circumnavigating the sun at a speed of 66,627 miles per hour. In one day, in one day, one day, we travel a distance moving around the, the sun of 1.6 million miles every day. And I looked at this woman and I said to her, sweetheart, do you realize yesterday ended at midnight and everything that you dealt with yesterday is 1.6 million miles away from you today. And I said, if you don't believe me, go home and fact check me. And you will discover that everything that you dealt with yesterday is 1.6 million miles away today. It's a new day. Yesterday ended at midnight. I just became a green pasture and restored a perspective on the inside of her the exhale that came out of her and when she exhaled that final time when the moment the revelation hit tears began to pour out of her eyes and she sighed a relief her shoulders relaxed peace came over her I didn't give her anything I showed her that God was moving her from what troubled her yesterday. He didn't just move it a stone's throw away. It was 1.6 million miles away in just one day. The awesomeness of God. He's a great God. He's a great God. Just put it in perspective. Because everybody that you meet is fighting some kind of battle. Everybody has a challenge, but it's yesterday's challenge. I'm trying to reach people, and everybody that I, I'm reaching 
I want to find people that are broken and minister to them. But there are two types that I'm always keenly aware that I, I'm ministering to. I'm reminded in the words of John Newton, he says, my grand point in preaching is to be able to break the hard heart and to heal the broken one. And that's always our aim. It's just trying to, to break the hard heart and to heal the broken one. And that's why God's word is a double-edged sword. Because it's breaking hard hearts and it's healing broken ones. Because oftentimes you discover that if God ever puts a sword to you while you're hurting, it's not to hurt you, it's to heal you. You have to cut to heal. And he cuts through the flesh in order to bring healing to us. And I just came to remind you today that you were born to make a difference in the life of another. You were born to make a difference in the life of another. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. So the priest nor the Levi would help the wounded man. So God used the Samaritan to do so. And so oftentimes, you know, we... We'll live our lives day by day and we feel like if we don't have measurable things that we can see over the course of the day that we have done, we feel like we've wasted time. But I'd just like to put you into remembrance of the words of Robert Louis Stevenson when he says, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. The success of your day is not determined by the harvest you reap. It is determined by the seeds that you plant. Because the seeds that you plant today will determine your harvest tomorrow. It will determine your harvest next week, next month, next season. It's determined by what you plant today. It's a good day if you planted seeds today. And if you find hurting people, every time you help somebody, you're planting seed. You're planting seed. Don't judge the day by the harvest. of People say, what do you have to show for today? It may not be what you gathered. It may be by what you gave. By what you gave. And let me just remind you of this. Givers always have a special place in the heart of God because you'll never see givers in a position where they have nothing to give. Even if they run out of money, they got encouragement. Even if they run out of money, they got strength. Even if they run out of money, they got vision. You know why? Because God keeps giving seed to the sower. Sometimes seed is a money. Sometimes seed is an idea. Sometimes seed is time. Sometimes seed are your children. God, if you are a sower, if you are a planter, God will always give you seed. God will always give you seed. God will always give you seed. If you find hurting people, God will always give you seed. He gives seed to the sower, not to hungry people. He gives seed to the sower. That's why if you really want God to give you seeds of ideas and seeds of inspiration, start sowing. The more you sow, my God, he'll just start pouring it back into you. God will open up something bigger than what you sow. Because there's, there's a harvest. The harvest is in the seed. We look for the harvest. The harvest is hidden in the seed. And he said, if you will let go of this, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die out of bods alone. But if you'll let go of it, it'll germinate. It'll open up. And you'll see the harvest that was hidden in the seed. If God ever wants to hide something, he hides it in a seed. He hides it in a seed. And you never know how big your harvest is just by looking at your seed. And I just want you to realize that people may not even recognize the blessing that's on the inside of you. They didn't recognize it with Jesus. The Bible says that when Jesus was in his, in his own hometown of Nazareth, he could there do no mighty works. The Bible says, and he marveled at their unbelief because they were too familiar with him. Because sometimes when God sends a person to help you, it's amazing how people that are not related to you can see your gift better than folks that are related to you. Better than people who are really close to you because they commit the sin of familiarity. So they are so familiar with you, with your flaws, with your human uh, you know, proclivities. They're so familiar with the lineage from which you came. They know your mama, your daddy, your grandmama, your uncle, your cousins. They know all of that, that they can't see the glory of God. But people who don't know your history can see your destiny. And they see the treasure of the gift that's on the inside of you. And so that's why sometimes you didn't choose it, but sometimes God will just thrust it upon you. 
He'll thrust it upon you just to be able to go and to help and to serve other people. I want you to get two words as I close. There are two things that I want you to think about. One is assignment. The second is alignment. Assignment is the task or duty to which God has called you. And alignment is the arrangement of yourself into a position of, of agreement, spiritually, mentally, morally, and physically. Sometimes you just got to be in the place. You got to physically be where God needs you to be at that time. Whenever God gets ready to use you, if there's a need in the earth, you have to recognize the assignment and then you have to bring yourself into alignment. Spiritually, mentally, you got to have your attitude right. Morally, physically, you got to come into alignment. Things don't flow if you're not in alignment. Malalignment stops the flow. There's an assignment and there's an alignment. Let me, let me distinguish the two. The assignment is about what you do. The alignment is about who you are. The, the assignment is about what you do. The alignment is about who you are. It is the difference between coaching and mentoring. Coaching is always about what you do. You coach people on the job to be better. You coach a golfer to be able to swing better and to have a better focus of what he's doing. You coach a basketball player, a football player to be able to perform well in that position. But you mentor the who, the character of who the man is, who the woman is. Coaching works on what you do. Mentoring works on who you are. It's not one or the other. We need both. We need coaches and mentors. But a coach is not a replacement for a mentor because if you're playing ball, if you're playing pro football, and if you get hurt, they're not going to come to your bedside and nurture you back to health. The coach is looking for your replacement to do the assignment because he can't have a vacancy on the team. And he's just trying to fill a void. And you got to find people that really love you now, that care about, care about who you are. That's when you need a mentor. That's when you need a father. That's when you need a mother of somebody who cares about you when you've been hurt. Don't look for a coach because a coach is not going to come because their focus is on what you do. The mentor is on who you are. And he's given us great opportunities. And say, so here's an assignment. Now come into alignment. I need you to be there spiritually. I need you to be there mentally. I need you to be there morally. I need you to be there physically. I need to use you to bind up their wounds, to change places with them, put them on your animal. Take them, make an investment in them and watch them as a seed grow. Watch the testimony of God spring up into their life. Watch fulfillment come into your life like you've never experienced before. And after Jesus finished this beautiful parable of the Good Samaritan, and shared with him really who was the good neighbor because it was the Samaritan that paid a cost to help someone. And then he looked at each of us down through the vista of time. He looked at us and said, go and do likewise. And this is what I want to tell you. Stay woke. Stay woke. Because you've got to be woke to see the opportunities of what God and who God has planted on your journey that you are duty bound to help. Stay woke. And after you do it and catch the challenge, to go and do likewise. Now think of ways to motivate others to do good works as well. So be it, see it, be it, and inspire someone else to do it as well. Go and do likewise and provoke someone else to do it as well. I pray that you got something out of the Word of God today. Bow your heads right where you are. If you're in the, 
in a place of listening and viewing and you say God I've been hurting and nobody came for me I want you to know God saw you God saw you he saw you the there's something about hurting people that draws the attention of God his eyes run to and fro in the earth Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted he loves broken people wherever the break is that's where the blood rushes he's coming toward hurting people and he loves you so much and I know you wonder if he loved me why did he let me get hurt I'm a parent my children have gotten hurt it didn't mean that I didn't love them I'm their father Sometimes I believe that God allows us to get hurt just to prove that he's a healer. And it gives each of them in their own way, their own testimony. And it gives them the ability to be able to see the faithfulness of God at a time when they're terribly uncomfortable. Because maybe they're going to have to minister that same grace to someone else. You might be in that place where you got angry with God because you were hurting and you said, God, nobody came for me. I was waiting for somebody to rise in and bind up my broken heart and I bled out. I cried myself to sleep until now I'm numb to all of the pain. I've just learned to live with pain. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but don't just stay in that numb state. It's a sign of ill health when you can no longer feel pain. Pain is a sign of health. If you can no longer feel, it means that there's a serious disconnect between your brain and your body. We need to be able to feel the pain. If you get seriously injured and you can't feel your legs, you're in deep trouble. If your legs hurt, you're in pretty good shape. But if you cannot feel the pain, you're in deep trouble. Jesus wanted to feel the pain on the cross and that's why he wouldn't accept the anesthetic that they tried to give him to numb the pain. Jesus said, I've got to feel this. I was born to die. I've got to feel it. Because if you don't feel my pain, you cannot write the prescription for my cure. Jesus felt the pain. He felt our pain. He hurt. He wept. And he wept with people who were weeping. When Mary and Martha lost their brother Lazarus, Jesus wept with them. There were only two times that he wept in Scripture. He wept when his friend Lazarus died. And he wept over Jerusalem. He wept over a city. And he wept over a friend. There is a time to weep. Your heart is crushed because of what's happening to the city. What's happening in our cities across America hurts my heart. I've wept over America. I weep when I see people that I know suffering and become afflicted. It burdens me. And if you don't ever feel it, you'll never do anything about it. So it is the first step in prompting us for change. I want you to know that you're not forsaken. And right where you are, if you're hurting, and if you got mad with God and wrote him off, I'm simply saying it's time now to turn back, turn back, turn back to God. Turn back to your first love, turn back. He welcomes you saying, come back home, come back. I want to receive you back into my kingdom. I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I have missed the mark. But I believe that you sent Jesus to die for me. He changed places with me. He took my death sentence because the wages of sin is death. I deserve to die. But Jesus took my place that I might have a right 
to the tree of life. Right now, I open my heart and I receive you, Lord Jesus, to come in to my heart. Live in me. Think through my thoughts. Move through my actions. And allow me to be an expression of your love in the earth. Empower me, O oh Lord, to become everything that I shall have wished I had become. When I stand before you, I make you my Lord this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, I want to welcome you to the family of God. And I want you to know that there are other people that are hurting just like you were that you need to go back and reach. And they don't always need to be people that look like you and who are from your background. But everybody that you meet is a part of your captive audience of you to be able to share the story of how you were bleeding out and how he restored your heart. Change is a process. It is a process, not an event. It doesn't happen always overnight. What happens in this moment of salvation is a catalytic moment that speeds up a reaction for change. But now you put, he puts you on a trajectory for God to rebuild your life and to restore you so that you become a restorer of other hurting people. And here's the principle. The broken become masters at mending. And if your life has ever been broken, God gives you a grace and an anointing to be able to mend other broken lives. If you've ever been molested, if you've ever been abused, you have a natural discernment to look into the eyes of another human being that's been molested or abused and recognize that look. I don't know how to explain it, but if you've ever been there, you recognize the look. If you've ever been hungry, you know the look of hunger in eyes, even when lips have not said, I'm hungry. You recognize a look in the eyes, even if the mouth has not spoken and said, I'm cold, I'm lonely. The eyes speak. And if you've ever been to that place yourself, you recognize the look. And that discernment allows us to then be touched with something that moves us with compassion to become an answer to somebody else's need and plant a seed that will blossom into a glorious harvest. And it will be for our good, but for his glory. It's always that way. It works for our good and his glory. Whatever happens, it works for our good ultimately and for his glory. God is going to receive the glory out of it. God is going to receive the glory out of it. He's not left you alone. No matter what's happening, we as Christians have to be too busy to hate. We are still called in the midst of craziness in our world to never let the craziness of the world enter into us and change who we are. We are God's ambassadors of good Samaritans, shining the love, the light, the compassion of Jesus Christ to hurting people, wherever we are, because he places them on our journey. May God give you eyes to be able to recognize the opportunities that he's placed in your midst that you have the capacity to be able to fill and express the love of Jesus to hurting people. I trust that you will walk with him this week and be on the lookout for those Good Samaritan moments because you never do know when you'll be the one on the ground in need of a Good Samaritan or somebody that you know. It may not be you. It could be a son or daughter. It could be a brother or sister. And so when you've sown toward one, God will redeem toward another. And he'll allow you sometimes to reap from fields in which you have not sown. But you've sown somewhere, but not directly. Because most of the time, the very people that you help 
have no capacity to return the blessing back to you. Very rarely is that the case, where they can reciprocate what you've done for them. But God will allow you to reap from someone else's field because you've sown in another field. So be the light. I encourage you this week, go and do likewise. You've been tagged now with the likewise challenge. Now go and provoke and motivate others toward love and good works. Have a great, great week. And we so long to see you. We desperately long to see you and to have you to be here in person and receiving what we can feel in the atmosphere of the house of the Lord. We've got a seat waiting for you and we're going to see you real, real soon. I just hope to be able to do it this time and numbers spiked again. So we're taking our time. We love you and we want you to be safe and we want God's grace to be abundant in your life. So we are planning for a wonderful safe return of your being able to be here and to share with us in a wonderful, wonderful service. And I cannot wait for that day when all of God's children get together and we can sing the praises of God and magnify his name and give him glory and honor. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Have a great one. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.